There was a time in my life where I kept better care of my video game instruction manuals than most people do of their actual books. I was certainly better organized when it came to them. I had these carefully chosen spots for each of them. The console manuals sat in this little plastic carrier separated by system in this little nook under the table that held the consoles themselves. Now, the PC manuals, being larger, wouldn't fit. They were in a magazine holder in the closet a few feet away. At a moment, I could find any of them, along with maps, reference cards, mini posters, and any of the other detritus that might tumble out of a game box. And why wouldn't I want to keep track of them? They were interesting little artifacts. Useful, yes, very useful, but also extensions of the games themselves. A manual was the absolute perfect length to read in a short car ride, a chance to make some productive use of those precious few hours when one didn't have a controller in his hands. Each little booklet represented a small but yeah, genuine effort on behalf of the developer to impress the person giving them money. But why did anyone bother? There may have been nothing less important to the popularity of a video game than the manual that came with it. I mean, many people bragged about not reading them, which is not a very impressive flex, but one that's hard to disprove. Many more skimmed the manual once, maybe twice, and then immediately misplaced or even discarded it. And that assumed you were buying new. Manuals being so frequently lost, it was quite unusual for a second-hand or rental game to come with one, and all but unheard of to receive one that was fully intact. So. What we're talking about is a non-critical, barely noticed, frequently destroyed object that many people would not receive at all. And yet, I would suggest that the people with the thankless task of writing and designing these manuals put in more effort than some of the developers put into the games themselves. Now, I know what you're thinking. There may be nothing on Earth more boring than an instruction manual. The modern world throws plenty of them at us for everything. Kitchen appliances, televisions, uh, vacuum cleaners, power tools, turntables, printers, electric fans, and the video game hardware itself. And they're unexceptional documents printed on the lightest possible paper stock and crammed margin to margin with tiny text and baffling diagrams. No one puts any real artistry into them because they're strictly utilitarian things. They're meant to sit in a junk drawer until something goes horribly wrong. Given this, video game developers would have been fully justified in pairing their games with quick little reference pamphlets listing the basic inputs. Something similar to the one-page cards that many retail chains put in with their games in lieu of the actual instructions. Most games just don't have complex controls or unusual mechanics, and the similarity of control schemes within genres means that most people probably would have been fine with this. They could have intuited it. But somewhere along the line, developers decided to invest more of their creative energies into making the manuals look really slick, often adding materials that went well beyond what anybody would expect to receive. Some manuals contained extensive backstory with short stories and chunks of lore writing into the thousands of words and beyond. Some manuals featured large tables and charts breaking down every item one might find in the game, and a few manuals went beyond even that including detailed walkthroughs. But even the most basic manual was still likely to contain art, screenshots, strategy advice, and maybe even some bad jokes. Some of these manuals, especially the nicer ones, seemed less like instructions and more like marketing materials. These were the kinds of things one might expect to find stapled into the binding of a magazine or maybe sitting in an open rack at the entrance of a toy store. These companies hid them inside of boxes to be seen only by people who'd already purchased the product. And one learned a lot about a new game from the manual as soon as it slid out of the box, even before paging through it. For one, the length told the story in itself. A typical manual for a console might run between 20 and 40 pages, enough for a few paragraphs of story, an introduction to the controls and mechanics, and perhaps a few pages to tease at the game's later levels. A manual that was noticeably thicker was bound to be for a more complex game, and probably one with more resources behind it given the low priority assigned to manuals. Now a used manual, and this is on the rare occasions one might spot such a unicorn in the wild, now that could tell a far more interesting story. I'd go so far as to say that you could learn more from someone else's manual than from someone else's save file. That you possess it at all means the previous owner, or owners, was more cautious than most, but the real tale is in the state of the thing, as people were never gentle with their manuals. 
Usually the cover would be the first to go, entirely ripped off, leaving the bare table of contents exposed to the world, every water-wrinkled page out in display to a voyeuristic world. Hmm. There's a good chance someone else wrote in it, too. Developers almost encourage people to write in their manuals what with those blank notes sections used to fill gaps in the formatting. Flip to the back of the manual and you might find either a useful code or a dirty joke you hadn't yet heard. But don't stop there. Any page might have a little story from a previous owner. You might find personal notes on the game, or a little doodle, or maybe notes from a phone call. Proof of a life on the other side of that pause screen. So, what happened? Because video game manuals have become increasingly rare. Now, unofficially, this has been going on for a long time, manuals getting ever more slim, while developers were leaning more heavily on their in-game tutorials. But officially, the great phase-out began a decade ago with Ubisoft. They presented this as a green initiative, though whether that refers to saving the environment or saving money is down to how cynical you are about big companies. Predictably, this announcement yielded many weepy encomiums from various and sundry hack writers, all eager to show their nostalgia over something they'd previously never talked about. But what none of them bothered to answer was why these colorful manuals existed at all. As a few of them pointed out, there was a time when game manuals were as cheap as the developers could possibly make them. So what changed? To recap the above, video game manuals never, ever made any sense. They were a largely unnecessary addition that many people ignored, that increased costs for the producer without drawing in more money, and that was only seen by people who'd already made the purchase. And what's more, they could be very indulgent, which was amusing for the end user, but really hard to justify in a business sense. And I'd like to illustrate this last point with one of my favorite examples, Final Fantasy Legend 3 for the Game Boy. Now, in addition to an already pretty stout 76-page manual, the game shipped with this. Now, this supplement is maybe a bit larger than a sheet of A4 when it's fully unfolded. Now, it's two-sided. One side that you're seeing features a map of the game world. The other side, contains tables with detailed stats on all of the game's equipment. It was a very useful thing to have in what was a relatively dense RPG, especially on the Game Boy. It also shipped with the Game Boy game, a portable, handheld game meant to be played while outside of the house. Unless you played your Game Boy exclusively in your own bedroom, this wasn't going to be very useful to you. I mean, sure, you could probably fold it up and put it in your pocket, but opening it up while balancing the system on your lap in the car could be tricky. It was very easy to rip the cheap, glossy paper when it was unfolded, and very easy to lose it within some inaccessible void in the car when folded up. So yeah, it was a useful supplement, and I for one appreciated having it, but there's no way to justify its inclusion. It's not like a similar supplement for a PC strategy game of the time, which one would play only in a fixed location, and which would likely be more essential besides. I mean, it's great, but it just shouldn't be, should it? Now, maybe I'll never know why developers put so much effort into something so trivial, but then I'm probably putting too much thought into it. Perhaps it's just added value, or something to give the consumer a good first impression. Now, in my more optimistic moments, I wonder if it was just a sign that some people really did care about their jobs, even above and beyond what any of us expected of them.